Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minog. And I'm Pat Shelton. Welcome to Real to Real. And we both welcome you together. We are alone, Pat. Yeah, somebody's missing. <laughs> Jane. Where's Jane? Jane is in the happy circumstance of preparing for her marriage. And I can't think of a better reason to be missing. <laughs> when she comes back, I wonder, will she still be Jane Rudolph? Or will she I be don't some? Know. I love that new name she's acquiring. She's going to be Mrs. Sean Tracy. And I hope to be very much part of that wedding ceremony. Jane has invited me to be part of it, and I'm very thrilled and privileged to be in it. We have some nice privilege tonight. In Profiles of Faith, we have two people, Father Bob Curtis and Paul Smith. We want you to meet two very special cases and two very special meditations. And I'm going to be talking with Joan Sabia, the Executive Director of South Philadelphia Victims Assistance. So if you know someone who's been a victim, or maybe you've been a victim, you'll be sure to stay tuned. Victimhood is pretty tough to handle, I guess, Pat. Oh, yeah. You know, it, the interesting thing is so many innocent people get involved in being victims. Mm -hmm. And um, we never know when it might be us. And it has no uh, quarter for anyone. We all are victims of ourselves. Even the stars get victimized. You've heard, I guess, of Paul Carlton, a very great ba guitar player, very great song leader. He has hip help for those who are impoverished because they are innocent victims, innocent people. We want you to hear this because in this instance you find out that a real star never diminishes its luster. Jazz and blues guitarist Larry Carlton has been performing since he was six years old. In the 70s he emerged as the LA studio star enlivening sessions with artists such as Barbara Streisand, Steely Dan, The Crusaders, and Joni Mitchell. During his career, Larry has won a couple of Grammys and received both gold and platinum albums. But on April 6, 1988, Larry Carlton became a victim of a violent crime, and he nearly lost his life. It was just a normal spring day, and I was just conversing with my secretary, and the door was open. I saw a little dog running. I thought, well, the dog's going to come in the office. I better go shut the door. And when I went to shut the door, there were two boys standing right outside, and one of them just pulled the 357 from behind his back. Uh, our eyes met as he pulled the trigger. I was obviously looking at him. And there was, it seemed like, you know, a two or three second moment where we just stood. And then he fired one shot, and it struck me in the throat. But when I laid, laid on the floor with blood gushing from me, uh, the words that came out of my heart were, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and let's go home. The bullet shattered Larry's cartoid artery, the main artery of the brain, and damaged his left vocal cord. I walked in when he was out of surgery, and I walked up to his bed, and he looked at me. He couldn't say anything. He barely see me, I'm sure, but he just went like this and waved at me, you know. Um, and then they did. They turned out good. Larry emerged from his traumatic experience with a determination to help other victims of random violence. He and his longtime friend and manager, Charlie Lico, organized HIP, Helping Innocent People, a nonprofit organization set up to supplement victim assistance offices nationwide. HIP provides direct funding to victims of crimes in their time of need. Once I was told, Larry, you're going to live and you'll gain full recovery and you'll play the guitar again, I realized how fortunate I was. Charlie was on the case, keeping our business dealings straight. My wife was completely on the case and talking to insurance people and at my side every moment. And again, one of those things that just comes to you. I thought a lot of people wouldn't have this. And we've been seeing this crime on television and hearing about it on the radio now for years. And I've never given a thought as to what happened to the people or their families during and after they became victims. I can assure you that HIP would not have been started had I not been an innocent victim of a violent crime. They're filling a void that is not filled by any other agency, no so social service agency. No one provides the type of services that HIP is designed for, and that's providing direct services for uh, crime victims. And we are also talking about uh, recouping of monetary losses. So if you're talking about an elderly lady who's just received her social security check and is mugged and that money is taken away, what recourse does she have? Those avenues are very limited. That's where HIP can come in, take care of the rent, take care of the food, and take care of whatever, whatever uh, that crime victim would necessarily need. 
something that is, is nationwide now. It's something that can benefit crime victims throughout the United States. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people fall victim to crimes across America each year. And millions of dollars are needed to help alleviate the financial hardship of such victims. So on December 9, 1988, the recovered Larry Carlton brought together some of his closest friends in the music business for a benefit performance in Los Angeles. He led the all-star lineup, his first appearance since the violent attack. I was left with this voice. And from this day forward, this is the voice I will bring to you that says I love you. And enough of this serious stuff. Let's have some fun and let's celebrate. Welcome back. With the support of his family and friends and his determination to play music again, Larry recovered from this brutal assault. The police have never found the two boys that shot him, and the memory of April 16, 1988, lingers. And yet, there's a calm acceptance of what's gone on in his life. I think uh, acceptance in this world for Larry Carlton is very important. You can change things, but you have to accept reality. And the reality is the kids got away. So I can't let that weigh on my heart. My life goes on. Each one of us deal with stress in our own ways. And this is obviously the most traumatic event that has ever happened in Larry Carlton's life. You have a choice to make, you know, every day. And for me, it was, well, my arm is completely paralyzed and hanging. <laughs> And people tell me if I go to therapy five days a week, I'll regain the use of that arm. Well, there was no ifs, ands, and buts about it. I was going to get up and go to therapy every day. And that's what it's all about, is life. It's about life. It's about living it in, in some kind of a harmony so that your neighbor and the other country, we all live together to focus for one thing, and that's a successful, happy life not one of greed, not one of too many things that we really don't need, and not one of too much programming on things that we don't need to look at. Carlton's infectious guitar playing has made him one of the most respected and entertaining musicians in the industry, so it isn't a surprise to find him playing to a sold-out house. Recently, he raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for his organization, HIF, while educating millions of Americans to the plight of crime victims. I'm making my music for people that love to hear my music and then raising their awareness about a very positive organization that can help some victims and most of the people were like myself and michelle my wife and charlie we didn't even know we didn't even think in terms of innocent victim of a violent crime they need help so just to say those words during a concert or during an interview people go gosh i had a friend that did this and they needed there's an awareness and it starts to snowball. My hope came from my faith in God and a wonderful family and dear friends. And out of the three things I've just named, maybe you don't have dear friends and maybe you don't have a close family, but God's with all of us. And I think if you take that with you through your tragedy, the rest of it will be a little easier to take. For that special team, there is still more to come, so please stay with us. Years ago, leukemia and related diseases took the lives of enough people to fill a ballpark. But today, more people are surviving, thanks to research by the Leukemia Society of America. Hi, I'm Gary Carter. Join the team that's striking out leukemia. Support the Leukemia Society of America. We're closing in on a killer. Many people find retirement isn't as much fun as they thought it would be. Too much time on their hands, too little to do. 
The Retired Senior Volunteer Program has thousands of opportunities for retired executives, housewives, engineers, teachers, whatever your skills or schedule. RSVP has something to fit anyone's interests. You've learned a lot in your life. Share the experience of a lifetime. That Larry Carlton piece was really, really interesting. I've enjoyed that man's music for years. One never knows when one might be a victim of violent crime. And right here in our own backyard in Philadelphia, where there is an awful lot of crime, there is a need for assistance for victims. And we have a lady with us today who is the executive director of the South Philadelphia Victims Assistance. Her name is Joan Sabia. She's the executive director, and Joan is a lady in the helping business. Thank you so much for being with Thank us, Joan. Thank you for inviting me. And first of all, before we learn what the South Philadelphia Victims Assistance is actually all about, would you tell us just a bit about yourself? How did you happen to get into this line of work? Well, I was teaching in the prisons in Holmesburg, and as I came to know the men and they shared their stories, many of them said they were victims of child abuse. One story in particular where a young boy was hung out off a high rise by the feet um, and how he told me his story and how even he was beating a man, he thought of his father the whole time. I began to wonder whether or not helping a victim would also help the problem with crime. Mm -hmm. And you, um, were you instrumental in beginning this organization? I was hired after it was formed by a graduate student and various people in South Philadelphia, including the police and dist district attorney's office. Okay. Now, this agency is called South Philadelphia Victims Assistance, right. so I assume that that is the, the area you serve. Right. Um, could you just define it just a little bit more? Sure. We service victims of all types, uh, anywhere from south of South Street mm -hmm. to the rivers, including the Navy Yard. And we go to preliminary hearings and help crime victims there and help them in any way that we can. Okay. Um, now, the first thing I thought about was you help them out financially, but you told me before that you lend a lot more some emotional support. Mm -hmm. uh, you're with them when they go actually into the courtroom, mm -hmm. and you help them through the maze of the legalities. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty us. overwhelming experience to go to uh, preliminary hearings and have to stand within three feet of the person who attacked you. I imagine. And that's often what has, happens in a preliminary hearing in South Philadelphia, especially with aggravated assaults. And if there's intimidation and so forth, we're there to assist them and provide uh, police support and our own emotional support. The district attorneys are often are much too busy with handling many cases in a particular morning. And so therefore, we're there to uh, negotiate the very complicated system and to give emotional support. We also help with the financial burden in the sense that victims are entitled to crime victims compensation. And so the forms are somewhat complicated and helping them fill out these forms is a, a tremendous help to them. It must be. I mean, all of a sudden you're in a, in a whole new situation. Right. Completely alien to you. Right. And you don't know what to do or who to turn to and you're there to hold yes. their hand and point them in the right direction. Are you uh, a busy lady? <laughs> Very busy, unfortunately. <laughs> there were 10,000 major crimes in South Philadelphia, over 10,000 last year. And so you can imagine the, the bulk of people coming in from everything from a car theft to murder. Okay. It must be very rewarding for you. Yes, I, uh, I like the healing profession. And I think from a faith perspective as a Catholic, I think that um, being there at the foot of the cross for an individual is extremely important. Mm -hmm. It's very Eucharistic and healing. Uh, do you find that the people who need your service, services the most are the elderly, the very young? They're all ages, all ages, um, from the elderly to um, the, the young. Child abuse cases are handled by D DHS and various child protective services in, in the Philadelphia area. 
but most every other case, we're there to service the, the family in the complicated healing process. And the complicated healing process, which is exacerbated by going through the process of the judicial system. But going through that process can be empowering yes. because then they take back the power that's been stripped from them. Well, it's lovely to know that you're there to help them know this and see this. And we have been talking with Joan Sabia, Executive Director of the South Philadelphia Victims Assistance. She's there for you if you need her. And now, Joan, I'm fortunate enough to be a member of a very um, long-running family that has a, a, a tradition of family reunions, 60 mm -hmm. consecutive years. But in today's hurry-up world, so many people lose touch with their families. Families are disjointed and falling apart. In our relationships feature today, Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons explains to us the importance of keeping our families together. In the not too distant past, families set aside time on a regular basis to come together with other family members. And this usually occurred on Sundays. Many of us have wonderful memories during those times when family seemed more important than shopping or football. In our society today, we're making a great mistake by failing to come together regularly as family. We're failing to appreciate what was known in the past, that this is extremely important. It's if we can have healthy, stable, loving family relationships, enjoy loving one another, work out our difficulties, then our chances of being successful in other relationships and in our lives is greater. One of the problems that's happened today is that people have just drifted apart. Families are drifting apart. They don't recognize how important it is to come together. Why is this happening? There are many reasons for this. The first is probably a change in the values of our society. Today, we're excessively materialistic, and selfishness is really in. And uh, some people, they have painful memories from childhood and adolescence where they felt cheated emotionally or financially. And when they come together, these memories stir up, so they prefer not coming together. Some families are divided by jealousy, by a tendency of some members to be overly controlling, by a loss of trust. They just don't feel safe and relaxed with members of their family. Some are divided by anger and hostility and others just by the pace of our society. Everyone moves so fast, we just don't think about setting aside time for family. Well, what can be done about this to change this? First, try to recognize that you gain a great deal by coming together with other members of your family. Their loves, their love, their gifts enrich you and strengthen you. Secondly, try to recognize how important it is to receive love. Thirdly, try to change your priorities. Try to think that Family and family gatherings are really more important than football, and they are more important than shopping, but you need to set aside time to meet. Also, it can be helpful to think back on the good memories, to think back on those times when you've enjoyed a brother or a sister or a family gathering and how good you felt about that. That'll lead you to try to want to be together. Finally, how about your reaching out and taking the first step to come together with some member of your family on a regular basis? Family tensions really can be healed, can't they? But it does take a little bit of humility, maybe on your part. Well, we want you to please stand by because we have a very special segment for you next. What can you do about AIDS? Talk to your family. Talk to your parents, to your teachers. Educate yourself and others about AIDS. Get the correct information so you can help dispel the myths. I know it's not going to be easy, but you have to talk to your parents about it. Volunteer to help. Talk to your kids. Be a friend. We 
welcome your comments and suggestions and encourage you to write us at Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, 19103. Or call us during regular business hours at 215-668-9842. Paul Smith, Father Bob Curtis. One is very hurt and very broken. The other is very much alive with the idea that from brokenness can come a wholeness if you really work it right. Some of the most unique masterpieces in art history have been created on the typewriter. But even more incredible is the man behind these works of art. Typewriter artist extraordinaire Paul Smith. Crippled since birth with severe spastic paralysis, Paul was not expected to live a month. Seventy years later, Paul lives at a nursing home in Oregon as a world-renowned artist, recognized by presidents and royalty alike. Yet, unbelievably, he is a man who is unable to hold a pen to write or even sign his name. For decades, his illness denied him the ability to walk, talk, read, or write. It was late in life before Paul could raise himself off the floor or even try to form words. Paul spent his first 32 years learning how to walk. The same extraordinary determination also enabled him to master typewriter painting. Using a battered typewriter, which he acquired in his teens, he laboriously experimented with punctuation marks, asterisks, and letter combinations, constantly turning the paper in the machine to obtain just the right angles. Paul uses the typewriter as other artists use a brush and palette. He uses only eight keys to paint stroke by stroke, carefully smudging for special shadow effects and changing ribbons to achieve different colors. After half a century of painstaking practice and hundreds of completed works to his credit, a library of Paul's paintings has been created by his best friend, John Cermak. I met Paul about 20 years ago, and I met him at the Rosehaven Nursing Home. And while I was there, I saw some these typewriter portraits on the wall, although when I first saw them, I had no realization that they were typewriter portraits. They were almost perfect in my eyes. And so I had to meet the man that uh, created them. And then when I found out that they were typewriter portraits, it, it was just unbelievable. But then after meeting Paul and seeing him, it was more unbelievable. Typewriter art isn't the only area in which Paul's genius is evident. His expertise at chess has earned him a national and international recognition as a chess master of merit. Besides playing chess on his computer, he plays several people simultaneously through the mail. Paul has a wonderful sense of humor. He uh, is conscious of his affliction, but he makes the most of it. In fact, he, he made the remark and he makes that remark to as many people as will listen to it. As he says, I'm a self-made man, but I goofed. And he accepts it by saying that the body he is living in is just temporary quarters. And when he is through with that, he is going to a paradise where there is no pain. My wish is I got to have I pray oh, for her. I hope I can make it. There's always a new day. God bless beginnings. Christians do not believe in endings, only beginnings. God bless beginnings. An ending is a broken thing, a finished thing. So God bless beginnings. On the other hand, life is built out of broken things. Ever think about that? Broken trees make whole houses. Broken boulders make whole churches. 
Wholeness comes out of brokenness. Everything new, everything new comes out of something broken. Not until the present is broken can a whole new future be born. God bless beginnings. The birth of Christ is the blessed beginning from which our beginning flows. In 2,000 years, has anything better happened to the world? Has man discovered anything more hopeful? Mars, we have found, is dead. Venus, we found, is an inferno. Has man invented anything better in 2,000 years? Atomic weapons, we found, have their certain drawbacks. No, our most valuable possession and possibility begins with the beginning of Jesus Christ. Christmas always comes in the dying shadow of an old year. The Christ child first appeared in the dark of night, the terminal cold of winter, in the decay of a stable. So Christmas always offers this paradox. Deepest darkness brings out the brightest light. The end is a new beginning. We must learn the meaning of this for our lives, that our spirits are blessed somehow when the circumstances of this earth seem the most tenuous and tough. When we're seemingly at an end, there's always room for us at the inn to give birth to something new in us. And that's the way of life. To search for guaranteed security is to waste energy on an illusion. To be profoundly insecure is to be in tune with our Savior, who shares our insecurity from the stable to the cross. Jesus Christ was never secure in this world. Why should we be? Listen, today might be very close to unbearable, but tomorrow's a new day. God bless beginnings. And God bless you. He talks about beginnings. We say goodbye. God bless you. Good show today. Join us next week, won't you? Real to Real. Good night. Travel arrangements for Real to Real by Atkinson and Mullen, Newtown Square, PA, 215-359-5980.